Turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 9, Luke 9. I pastored in uh, South Africa for seven and a half years. Such a fascinating mixture of races and cultures. Went in <clears throat> September for the conference and in the uh, office during the break, I had pastors asking me questions concerning various problems they were facing. And my answer to a man who was asking these questions, it had to do with the supernatural power of God overcoming demonic opposition. So you, South Africa is a mixture. I had white guys, I had Africans, I had all flavors in the office. The, the interesting thing to me was the difference in response as I'm saying that that's demonic, that's from hell. And you, you need to take authority, cast that out. The difference in response between white Westerners and Africans. The Africans, I, that's, those are demons. You gotta cast it out, they're like, mm-hmm. But the white Westerners are like, okay. And what was clear is they had different worldviews. They looked at life differently. And of course, that is because of upbringing. And so, uh, in a simple version, Africans generally have a worldview that includes the supernatural. Westerners often do not have a supernatural worldview. So. We're going to look at our text. This is a, a, a sending text. Jesus is sending his disciples into the ministry. And I want you to catch this. He says, you want to build a work for God, you must drive out demons. So I want to preach about a supernatural worldview. Two verses, Luke 9, 1 and 2. When Jesus called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. A supernatural worldview. Let's talk about your worldview for a moment. Every person here, you have a worldview. By definition, that means a conceptual framework that helps you understand life. You look at life and you need a way to interpret what is happening to me. So your worldview is three things. Number one, how do you interpret life, especially negative circumstances? The big question in life when bad things happen, why? Why is this happening to me and where? Where is this coming from? Some people believe in luck. It's just random chance. It just happened that your number came up. Others. They view life, uh, bad things are happening because of God. Uh, he's uh, punishing me, but then of course, if he's punishing me, what did I do? That is so bad. So, your worldview, how you interpret life. Number two, how you view life and negative circumstances. So, if you are having bad things happen or you're having struggles, how should you feel about that? How should you react if you come from a religion that believes in karma? Is you are looking at the problems of life, there's nothing you can do. You are fated to uh, uh, experience that. Calvinism uh, would look at negative circumstances and say, God planned this. He predestined for your life to stink. That's just the way it is. And then some of you used to be Catholics. It's very common. Catholic guilt. Catholics often look at life like this is bad things are happening. It's like I deserve it because that's been drilled into them. How you view life and circumstances. Thirdly is your worldview what actions should I take in light of what's happening to me? Can anything be done about the problems and the struggles of my life? And is God the answer for what I'm facing? Or should we look outside for supernatural help? So, worldview. Everybody has a worldview. 
to some degree, it involves those three elements. You gain your worldview from how you're raised. You gain it from your culture, your education, and perhaps from your religion. Look at the two most common worldviews in life. Number one, there is the secular worldview. This would typically be from Western societies. A secular worldview looks at life and problems and says, life consists only of what is natural and physical. We rely on our senses. We rely on science. Life is only about what we can see, examine, measure, and test. And if there are bad things happening in life, it must be explained solely with natural explanations, cause and effect, genes and germs, random chance, there is no reason for it. And so in a secular worldview, the spiritual or the supernatural dimension has no effect in our lives. They're looking at problems. That cannot be supernatural. There must be a natural explanation. What's interesting is that many Westerners, in fact, not only do they not allow for the supernatural dimension, it's very common Westerners are embarrassed by it. I've been around the world and sometimes I'll be inspired and say, I'm going to pray for people. How many of you here, you wake up at night and you can feel something evil in your room? Or maybe even you wake up, you can feel something sitting on you. How many of you here, you see things walking through your house? Right? So what happens, very interesting, is that people get like really embarrassed. Like... <laughs> until someone lifts their hand, then a whole bunch, you know, come on. The pr Westerners would rather admit they have hemorrhoids than the fact that there's something <laughs> supernatural. Because they just have no file for this. They, that's like, <sighs> weird things happen. I don't know, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. That's a secular worldview. Then we have a spiritual worldview, and this would tend to be more in the third world. A, a spiritual worldview says there is a natural and a physical world, but it is intertwined with the supernatural. They believe that the supernatural world affects the natural world or the physical world. For some, in some places, that will be gods. There are supernatural beings that will help you, give you protection, give you money. Caesar's Palace Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. At the front of it, it has a huge shrine to a Thai Brahma god of money because this is how they view it. Gods can help me get money. Supernatural effects, the physical. I went to South Africa, I got a fantastic education. I was raised in a small town in Prescott, moved to beautiful Perth, West Australia. Now I'm in uh, uh, South Africa. I was witnessing in Shoela, which is the lower part of Soweto. I witnessed a man, let me tell you about Jesus, and, and he was African. He looked at me and sneering. He says, I'm not interested in your power. He said, I have my own power. I said, okay. And I said, out of curiosity, what is that power? He said, it's the power of the ancestors. So I didn't know a lot of people who worshiped ancestors where I come from. So I said, please explain to me how that works. And he told me a story. He said he was falsely accused of rape facing a court date. He said he's on a taxi and a woman turned to him that he didn't know. She clearly was a witch. She looked at him, said, you're in trouble with the police. And the reason why you have offended your grandparents who are dead. What is the answer? Take a chicken, go to the grave, sacrifice the chicken over the grave, and apologize to your dead grandparents. So he did it. And he said after doing that, when he arrived at court, the woman who uh, was accusing him ran out of the court apologizing, saying, I'm withdrawing the charges. And so he said, I was off. So I said, okay, let me... 
So what you're saying is your dead relatives are actively involved in your life. And he said, absolutely. I said, okay, now I get how you think. But I'm a thinker. So I said, okay, if your dead relatives are involved in your life, I said, can I ask a question? Were your grandparents poor? He said, yes, very poor. Did they have a lot of problems in their life? He said, yes. He said, maybe have problems with addictions, alcohol, gambling, cigarettes. And he said, yes. So I said, I don't get it. While they're alive, they couldn't help themselves, but now they're dead, they can help you? Right? Okay, so, but this is a worldview. There are many people in the world, that is how they're looking at life. The supernatural is affecting my life. So the Bible is very clear. There is an unseen world and it does have a direct effect on our lives. It's supernatural. Super means above. It is above or beyond what is natural. It goes beyond what you can see, measure, test, or explain. Verse 1, he says to drive out all demons. Matthew 10, 1 calls them evil spirits. Elsewhere in the Gospels, they're called devils. This is talking about evil spiritual beings. They're not ghosts that are floating around and just haunting people. He's talking about evil spiritual beings that are actively involved in people's lives in, in uh, uh, various ways, causing torment, problems, and resistance. See, the Bible has a supernatural worldview. The Bible teaches us that it is true that the spiritual world affects the physical. Think about Job. He's a man with many physical problems. His money is being robbed. You can look and say that was enemies that did that. There is destruction in his life. There's terrible storms of wind and lightning that are destroying. And then, of course, sickness. But God allows us to see the bigger picture in chapter 1. It all begins with a supernatural world that the devil is involved in all of these problems. They were not just physical. There was a supernatural power behind them. See, listen, if you do not have a spiritual worldview or a supernatural worldview, you are going to struggle in life unnecessarily. Because everything that happens to you, you're going to have only a natural interpretation. That's not enough. You have people that they say, every time I get ahead financially, something breaks, someone gets sick, I lose my job. Like every time. And they're looking at that like, man, am I unlucky or what? Coincidence. They say, you know, things happen at certain times. I've had people tell me, every time we have revival, someone gets sick and I can't come to revival. How does the sickness know it's time for revival? <laughs> <laughs> the germs got together and said, it starts on Sunday. There are people that you go to doctors. I believe in doctors. I have good doctors. I, I go to them. But you've had doctors tell you, in your physical problem, we have no idea why this is happening. They've given you medicine that should have worked. It did nothing. They've operated. It should have fixed it. Didn't fix it. And so they're saying, we have no idea. The physical is not explaining that. Listen, some things in life cannot be explained naturally. We had a, a house in Prescott. You know what happens? You get to, in a place where rents are, are high. When you get a house that's cheap rent, it's often passed on from couple to couple in the, fa in the church. There was a house that people would move into. Every time a new couple would move into this house, someone would get sick with cancer. And then they would come to Pastor Mitchell, again, white Westerners, they're very embarrassed. It's like, uh, Pastor Mitchell, 
When we come into the living room, like in the middle of the night, the rocking chair is rocking by itself. There's no one there. On a freezing cold morning, I put my slippers on. They're warm like somebody had been wearing them. That ain't natural. Right? You know that in South Africa, one of the first people that I met, he was a witch doctor, and I did not know this. And so in time, finally, when he confessed to me that he was involved, he was a Sangoma, very powerful witch doctor. And uh, so I brought him to a decision. He told me he, when, the night he confessed, said, come to my house. He brought out all of his witchcraft paraphernalia. He said, with this, I can uh, get luck. With this, I can get money. With this, I can get love and all that. And I said, number one, you are tormented. He had not slept a full night in years. Number two, you say that, but I don't see any luck, love, or money in your life. <laughs> and number three, you're going to burn in hell. So what do you want to do? Jesus can set you free. He said, I want Jesus. I said, okay. Yes. I prayed for him, led him in a sinner's prayer. He manifested. I cast out real demons out of him. And then I took all of his witchcraft paraphernalia. I took it home with me that night. Went in the backyard. I soaked it all in petrol and I burned it up, except he had, I don't remember what the African term for it, it's a, a stick and it's got a horse's tail on it. This is what they would wave through the smoke as they're doing muti and juju and all that. This thing is wood and horse hair. It's soaked in petrol and it would not burn. Okay, it's not like witch doctors have a safety organization, right? <laughs> You know, make sure you put fire retardant. <laughs> I saw that and I said, that is not natural. I, that thing should burn. It's not because it's supernatural. So I don't even want that on my property. I took it that very night, went to a local grocery store and threw it in their bin. <laughs> And they went out of business the next week. No, no. I'm, I'm kidding. So, the supernatural is real. You can't explain it naturally. So, the Bible connects ministry for God to a spiritual or a supernatural dimension. There are five sending texts in the Gospels, and each of them connect ministry to the supernatural. Luke 9, 1, I give you authority to drive out all demons. Matthew 10, 1, I give you authority to drive out evil spirits. Luke 17, even demons are subject to us. Matthew 28, 18, all authority is given to me. And Mark 16, 17, you will drive out all demons. So if you are trying to do a work for God and you do not include a supernatural worldview, you are going to struggle because you are tr going to try to do what is essentially a supernatural work, but you're going to try to do it with only natural abilities that will never work. I'm asked often the question, uh, uh, two, uh, two questions. One is, uh, can this be witchcraft? They will describe bizarre things that are happening in their life, whether it's sickness or financially. Every time we get a convert, then they tell me something bad that happens and they lose the convert. They talk about struggles uh, uh, emotionally or mentally, different kinds of things that they're experiencing. It is not natural. It is supernatural. And that is a worldview in them. People ask about curses. Is it possible for people to be cursed? And the answer is, of course, you can. So my point is this is a worldview. When you go into ministry, you are either looking at life and ministry through natural eyes, and you're going to struggle. 
because there are things that are not natural, or you will look at life biblically, which is supernatural worldview. Let's talk secondly about demons in ministry. Three different kinds of demons I want you to think about. Number one, let's talk about entrenched demonic powers. When there are repeated sinful actions, they give the devil the right to rule in a person's life, a family, an area. Mark 3, 27, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. Jesus is giving us, this is a parable, but he's giving us a picture. This is how life works. You want something good, but there is armed resistance. There is someone fighting you so that you're not able to do that. Curses. Is it possible for people to be cursed? Absolutely. You can see this demonic resistance in families, in areas of believers' lives, in cities, and in churches. I, I don't know if you, if you have a spiritual sensitivity. I sometimes will go into an area or a city. It's like, I don't know what they've been doing here, but this place feels funky. You, you can feel it. There's something demonic uh, about that. So that's entrenched demons. Number two, outside demonic assault. This is not necessarily demons that are entrenched and have a right to rule there. They're, this is just evil spirits that are temporarily warring against you. There doesn't have to be a reason for it. Maybe just the devil is in the area. We understand that demons, there was only one third of the angels. They're limited. They can't be everywhere at the same time. That's why, pastor, if you'll pay attention, what is going on in your life generally is going on in the congregation. Okay? You need to learn that because the devil's in the area. And then sometimes this can be witchcraft. They're targeting you. This witch doctor, I did not know for... Uh, I think 18 months that he was a witch doctor. I had no idea. He didn't have a bone through his nose, so I couldn't tell, right? <laughs> so, but now what was happening, I, I have never had trouble sleeping. I could sleep anywhere. I grew up in church, right? So I can sleep anywhere. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we moved to South Africa, and now suddenly Lisa and I start waking up at 3 a.m., not 2.55, 3.05 is definitely out of there. It is 3 a.m. Bing, our eyes are open. Now, 18 months later, he confesses to me that each night the witch doctors have been gathering together to try and curse us. And I said, what time was that? <laughs> 3 a.m. Let me poke you in the eye. I mean, <laughs> Don't mess with my coffee and don't mess with my sleep. That, I'm not going to put up with that. That ain't right. Third kind of <clears throat> demon powers is internal opposition. So these are people who are causing supernatural opposition, but they're people you come in contact with, maybe even on a regular basis. Manipulation is one of these. Galatians 5 talks about the works of the flesh, and it lists, King James, sorcery, other translation, witchcraft. Witchcraft doesn't have to be black magic. Doesn't have to be juju. Doesn't have to be muti or whatever you call it in your country. It's a work of the flesh. When I left South Africa after seven and a half years, I must confess, I got on the plane, I'm headed for America, and I said, you know, one of the things I'm looking forward to in America is there won't be any more witchcraft. <laughs> oh, foolish man. But So, uh, for, for seven and a half years, there, there are times as a missionary in Africa, you feel it's intense. And I was looking forward to not feeling that. I, I wanted some, you know, Rest in peace, that would be nice. And so, 
I come back within weeks of coming in the Prescott Church, had a family, the son, he was a little demon, teenager, fornicator, I, I'm after him. And so finally, I get him and I have to discipline him. The moment that that happens, his parents were very upset with me that I dare discipline their angel. So, we stand at the door, front door of the church, Pastor Mitchell and I, and shake hands, and they would come in, and they would smile at Pastor Mitchell, and they look at me, and they go, <laughs> I'd be preaching, and they'd be sitting there. <laughs> but what freaked me out what I felt from them was exactly what I felt from the black magic witch doctor. And I'm going to tell you that mess in my head because I knew these people were not sacrificing cats. <laughs> How can it be that these nice white Americans can have the same spiritual power as an African witch doctor because witchcraft is a work of the flesh it is manipulation I will make you do what I want you to do rebellion has this I took a church uh, one time and uh, I told you about it the two years of hell I took this church it was uh, when I took it, I was handed a box. It was ticking, and I thought inside was a gift alarm clock, but it wasn't. It was a bomb. <laughs> we went through two terrible church splits. It was unbelievable, the wickedness there that we went through. But one of the things that I went through is in the intense climate of rebellion, I would be on stage, we'd be singing, I would close my eyes, and when I would close my eyes, there would be times I could physically feel someone choking me. I thought someone rushed up on stage. I don't mind. There would be no one there. So, again, that is a form of witchcraft. That's why the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That's one of the reasons. Because it is, I will make you do what I want. And then, of course, you will have people who come to church and yet they are literally involved in witchcraft. So, this is very common. And let me say, in, in many uh, uh, African or Caribbean uh, uh, cultures, they believe in the technical term is syncretism. That is, we mix. Jesus is going to get me to heaven, but I have real problems. So I still go to the witchcraft, the juju man, the muti man, witch doctor, voodoo, whatever it is, for my problems. The witch doctor, he said, Sundays was his busiest day because Christians would go to church, they took care of their soul, but now we got real problems, so now they would go involve themselves in witchcraft for luck, money, sickness, whatever else it was. So, we will have people in our churches who are still involved in witchcraft. Sometime back in, in one of our churches in South Africa that we had planted, the pastor called me. He said, Pastor, I, I need to talk to you. Very strange thing happened. A young man in, in church, I think he was like 24 dating a girl in church that was right at his age. And uh, they're starting this relationship, of course, because they don't have a lot of money. They can't hang out in restaurants or whatever. So he would go over to her house where her mother was. You know, nothing immoral here, but would go to the house and would spend time with them. He said, Pastor, the mother and this young man have just come to me and announced that he broke up with a daughter, he's going to marry the mother who is 40 years older than him. <laughs> I, said, I said, look, you know, people can do what they want, but there is something seriously wrong here. I, I, don't, I don't know what flavor of wrong, but there's something wrong. <laughs> and I said, listen, 
on the inside, I feel there's something so wrong, I would put them out of church and say, no, I will not let you marry and come to my church. He did that. They've been out of church for a couple of years. In the meantime, he left. A new pastor has come. And so at the South African conference, the new pastor is saying, hey, pastor, remember that couple where the mother married? Yeah, I remember that. He said, they've been begging me now. It's been a couple of years. They want to come back to church. Can we get together and discuss this? I said, okay. So we're going to discuss it after at the... Uh, 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 the last, uh, during the last uh, uh, seminar, uh, after the break, during the seminar, a white South African pastor started asking me these questions, and this is kind of part of where the sermon came from, and I'm answering, that's witchcraft, that's demonic, and he tells this story. He said, I had an impact team come from one of the local churches. During the day, they helped us. A lot of people got saved. It's fantastic. We're having revival. He said that night before the service, we're having prayer meeting. And he said, suddenly in the prayer room, strange pain just seized me down one side. And he said, I prayed and said, God, where is this coming from? And he said, God spoke to me and said, there's a witch sitting on your left. And he said, when I looked on the left, it was a lady from the church who had come on the impact team. She comes to every service, been in the church for years. He said, I prayed against it and the pain left. And he said to the new pastor, he said, oh, you probably don't know this lady. She doesn't come anymore. And he named her by name. And the pastor said to me, pastor, it's the lady the one who is 40 years older. So the real issue is she had bewitched this young man. So that the young pretty daughter, uh-uh, don't want her, I want grandma. <laughs> right? Okay. But I'm not talking out on the streets. They're coming to church. And some of you are like, <laughs> let's talk finally about driving out demons. So, what is needed in life and ministry is awareness. What you have to have is a supernatural worldview. You have to be aware that you face supernatural opposition. Partly that involves sensitivity. Pastoring is more than just words and facts and doctrines. Pastoring, you have to be able to feel things. And you better be able to feel when something is wrong spiritually. You better be able to feel when someone is wrong. Elisha prayed for his servant and he said, God, open his eyes. And when his eyes were opened, he saw... The spiritual world that was involved in their life. Paul, the Bible says, Acts 16, uh, a young girl who has, as he discovers, a spirit, a python spirit, some translations say, a snake spirit, a spirit of divination. She's following them, saying the right things. These men are the servants of the Most High God. But the Bible says for many days she did this, but Paul was grieved. She's saying the right things, but there is something about her that bothers me. And finally he turned to her and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. So you have to have this understanding. Now, Please, I understand anytime you talk about something, people go to extreme, Woo, right? Okay, not everything in life is a demon. Okay, I know there are imbalanced people. I got a flat tire. It must be a demon. No, you ran over a nail, okay? It's not, that's not a demon. And not everyone is a witch. I know that... Pastors, you go, yeah, I think I got a lot of witches in my church. No, 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 no. Nor can you blame the problems you created on demons, right? 
If you're having financial problems and you don't budget and you keep spending more than you make, you are the demon. Okay? So. <laughs> But I'm talking about a recognition. Some of you, you have to recognize patterns of loss, right? Someone who says, every time I get a bit of money in the bank, something, all right, that's a pattern. Every time we get a new convert, that's a pattern. We pass out five jillion flyers and no one comes. That's a pattern. That's not normal. That's supernatural. So you have to recognize it. And in our text, Jesus is sending his people to work in ministry for him. And he says, I am going to give you, you're facing supernatural opposition. I am going to give you supernatural power that will help you overcome supernatural opposition. Luke 9, 1. Here's our verse. He called the 12 together. He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons. Power literally means might or force, and authority means the right to use someone else's power. If you're driving down the road and a, and a young police constable steps out, it don't matter, they only weigh 115 pounds, where they put their hand out, the problem is not how much do they weigh, the issue is, what power do they have behind them? Jesus says, I'm sending you. I don't really care how smart you are, talented you are. There's power. I'm going to give you my power so you can enforce it. This shows us the biblical understanding of dominion. Dominion simply means the right to rule. In the book of uh, Joshua, they conquer five kings. They put them in a cave. When the battle's over, Joshua says, bring those kings out here. These are the guys. They were kings. They ruled in this area. They made them lay on the ground, and they got some leaders. He said, put your foot on their neck. That is literally what dominion means. It means to tread on, put your foot on because they're publicly saying, these demon kings used to rule here, but not anymore. We belong to God. We determine what happens here. That is what dominion actually means. It means you determine what happens. The devil doesn't determine what happens. Mark 1, 25 and 26. Jesus rebuked the demon saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit convulsed and cried out with a loud voice, he came out. Jesus says, I determine what happens here, not the demon. You need to learn that. And that's the authority he gives us. So people want to know, what's, what's the formula? What do you say? Do you say in the name of Jesus or in Jesus' name? <laughs> right? Who cares? It's, it's not a formula. Do you hold your hand like this? Or do you, have... <laughs> you know what dominion is? Dominion is simply a posture in life. It is simply an approach. It is simply saying, I recognize there are demons in my life, in my church, in my family, whatever's going on, this is from hell, and I'm not going to put up with it. Because I've been given authority. It is a, and it's an approach to life, you enforce dominion primarily through prayer. You identify what is not God's will, and then you pray against it. Binding and loosing, Jesus said. You can bind. I forbid. I will not let those spirits block my converts anymore. I rebuke those spirits that steal my money or keep me from the blessing of God. Loosing, I release in my converts. I want them to have revelation. I want their eyes to be opened. I want them to understand that. Sometimes this comes through praying for light, and I mean revelation. This is not true in every case, but sometimes you can pray and God will reveal what the problem is or where it's coming from. Isaiah 45, 
2 and 3, he'll give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places. I had a lady in our church that she was sick, I mean, for years and years and ye one thing after another, very sickly, often missed church. I uh, was preaching uh, one morning, I don't remember what I was preaching on, but nonetheless, while I was preaching, God spoke to her and she remembered her brother who was out of prison that he had a girlfriend and his girlfriend was a Native American and they're often involved in, in uh, various forms of witchcraft. She lived in a city called Jerome. This is a funky little town where lots of uh, witches live. And so this girlfriend had given her some kind of pottery piece. I don't know if it was a vase or something. And uh, it was in the house, and she told her husband, she said, when we get home, remind me about, remember that, the, uh, the vase uh, that uh, were given? He said, remind me. When they got home, it was up high on a shelf. They never even thought about it. So he got it down, and she asked her husband, she said, break that for me. And he said, no, God spoke to you, you break it. And so she did. She took it and she smashed it. The moment that she broke that, she got healed. God has done a miracle in her body. It is an absolute transformation. There was something demonic in her life, but God gave her light. So you don't have to make this a witch hunt or is there something in my house? You're looking at your wife. Maybe it's you. No. <laughs> No, it, I often pray, God, if there's something that I need to know, you love me, you can show me. And he can do that. Sometimes you have to approach a problem with a person supernaturally. Listen, pastors, if you don't have a supernatural worldview, every time you have a problem with someone in church, you will approach it naturally. I'm going to tell you off. I'm going to straighten you out. I'm going to kick you out. Though that's all you can do. The only answer you have for people problems is death. <laughs> what you don't understand is there are spiritual powers that motivate people. My first instinct when I have someone, they're opposing me or I, I sense there's something wrong and I don't know why something is wrong with them. The very first thing I will do before I meet with them, attack them, jam them, kill them. First, I will go to the church when no one's there. Because in most churches, you know what, how it works? Is people sit in the same seats, don't they? So I have a good idea where they're going to sit. I will go and I will lay hands on their seat. And I'll say, God, I don't know what's going on in these people, but I'm asking you, first of all, God, heal them. Wouldn't that be better for them to be healed instead of die? I want them to be healed. I've had people that they're opposing, they're, and I have prayed, and God has done a miracle in their heart, and they have turned for the good. Other people, God, expose whatever's going on in them, and then out comes, you know, hidden sin or whatever they're involved in in that way. I will, first of all, approach it supernaturally. I'll, I'll pray. I'll lay hands on the... The, uh, the door frame of the church and say, God, I do not want opposition to be allowed to come in here. I want liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Is that what it says? That's how I want. I don't want to have services where you're, everything's bound up. And No, we're going to have freedom here. You approach it supernaturally. And then sometimes that may be individual. That day in the pastor's office in South Africa, when this man told me the story and where this sermon came from, I just told you about. One of the pastors, who's, he actually is our first convert, the witch doctor brought him to my house. He and his wife were saved in our house. And now they're pastoring. God's doing a, a great work. They're church planters doing a good work for God. He told me a story. He said, in our church, we went through a dry season. We were not having any visitors. And he said, then... To the point on outreach, 
In South Africa, no one was getting saved. I'm going to tell you, that is very strange for South Africa. So he prayed, God, he prayed on a Saturday afternoon, God, you have to show me something is wrong, and you need to show me what is wrong. The next morning, a young girl came up to him and said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. My mother invited another lady from the church, a lady who comes every service, who they thought was a good lady. We had her over uh, for fellowship, spent the afternoon with us. And she said, then she left. And when she left, I went and looked underneath her chair. There were bones. So I don't know if you understand this. The, the witch doctor, when he finally confessed to me that he was involved in witchcraft, his first words were, I throw the bones. They use bones in various ways for witchcraft. So she says, we found bones underneath her chair. So the pastor, that he, he's told that in the morning, in the evening service, he calls this lady over and he asks, are you involved in witchcraft? She's like, no, pastor. So what about the bones? What's, what's up with the bones? You, had, you left bones under the chair and finally... You know, like, apparently she liked chicken. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and finally she confessed. She said, yes, pastor, I have to keep away the evil spirits. So wherever I go, I bring bones and I put bones under the chairs so the evil spirits can't get us. But that's witchcraft. He judged her, put her out of church, and he said immediately, Visitors started coming. People started getting saved. He said even the money jumped when he dealt with witchcraft. So I am t preaching this because there are people you are going through life without an understanding of a spiritual worldview, a supernatural worldview. You're going to struggle. What you need is to gain a biblical understanding. Therefore, take the authority God gives and enforce the victory of dominion. Let's bow our heads. Thank God. Thank God. Quickly, while our eyes are closed, I want to give a challenge. First of all, there are people that are here. You are not right with God. You're living in sin. God would not be pleased with the way you're living. You must repent and turn from your sin. If that's you... You want to pray this, this afternoon and turn from your sin. I want you to do one thing. Lift your hand so I can see it. Say, Pastor Greg, I'm not right with God. I know that. I want to be honest. I want God to save me. God to forgive me at the back. Thank you. How many others? Lift up your hand. All across this place. Lift up your hand. Thank God. My brother, you lifted your hand. I want you to come to the front right now. You're backslidden. You need Jesus. I want you to come to the front. Get out of your seat. You need to get saved. You come to the front. You bring them. You saw who that was. You bring them, help them to pray. There may be people, in a moment, we're going to open the altars. There, no doubt, are people that are here. You come from a culture where witchcraft is a normal part of life. I am challenging you, if you say you're a Christian, you must not be involved in witchcraft. That is wickedness. God will judge you if you continue to be involved in witchcraft, whether you're trying to keep away evil spirits or gain good things in life. And when we open the altar, some of you need to repent. And if you have anything in your house, if you are wearing any charm or amulet to protect you against evil spirit, you must get rid of it or you're going to curse your life. God will not allow that. But for everyone... Some of you here, while I'm preaching, lights are going on. You say, you know what? What I'm facing, this is not normal. This is from hell. Maybe even you already know why, where it's coming from. Maybe you don't, but you say, I, am, I don't have to live like this. God has given me authority, and I'm going to have the victory. Let's stand up to our feet. The, open, the altars are open. I'm inviting you. You come. Find a place to pray. Talk to God. You tell God, I'm going to have authority in my life. They're going to sing while people are coming. Thank you, Jesus. Lost a sin.
together God is going to lift something off of your life because we have power and authority given to us by Jesus Christ I want you to lift up your hands in the air I want you to say Father God I recognize 
there are demonic powers working against me in my life and that is not your will I break the curse of barrenness I cast out sickness mental torment poverty will leave my life I will have freedom I will have healing I will be blessed in money my church will be fruitful we will have fruit much fruit and our fruit will remain and I thank you for that in my home there will be peace we will rest and be able to sleep in my family there is going to be blessing on the job I will have blessing and I thank you for deliverance that comes through the authority in the name of Jesus Christ amen now let's praise God let's thank God people that are here you are sick in your body and sometimes you know I understand I, I get genes and germs and all the things like that sickness often has a spiritual root there are people that are here you're sick in your body you need healing I want you to lift up your hand how many here need healing need healing need healing all right put your hand on your body you can put it where the problem is if you've got more than one problem put it on your head God is smart enough to know where the power needs to go He's going to help you. But God is going to touch you. We have prayed and broken the curse, and now I'm going to believe God for a miracle. Say this out loud. Say, God, I'm your child. You don't want me to be sick. You want me well. I cast out infirmity. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command my body to function normally. I will be whole. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise God right now. God, touch them. Right now, let healing power flow. Let healing power flow. Oh, God, right now, let healing power flow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If we prayed, I want you to check your body right now. I know some things you can only tell in time, but some of you, if it hurt to raise your arm, to bend over, to uh, bend down, what, I want you to do that right now. Check. If it hurt to breathe, 
You had difficulty breathing. Take a big breath. You had difficulty seeing. Look out of that eye. Listen out of the ear. Whatever it is, feel for the pain where there was pain before. Push. If you felt a tumor or a cyst or a lump, press. Check for that right now. I'm believing God. How many of you already, you know that God healed you? Lift your hand. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Numbers of people. Thank God. Thank God. God. And I want to pray for one more thing, and that is there are people in your home. Two things I said before. Some of you, you, your sleep is interrupted by things that are demonic. Maybe you've been embarrassed to, to say it, but some of you, you can literally see things moving in your house. Some of you can feel an evil presence in your bedroom. Others, maybe it's not like that, but you're, you cannot sleep or your sleep is interrupted where you have no rest. That is from hell. The Bible says the demonic strategy is to wear out the saints of the Most High. Sleep, the Bible says, is a gift from God. He gives his beloved sleep. How many of you need God to help you in the area of sleep or in your home and rest in one of the ways we're talking about? Thank God. Lift up your hands. I want you to say this. God... You promised me sleep and rest, and that's what I need. My sleep is being affected. My home is being affected. That is from hell. I cast it out. I will not be tormented. We will have peace. We will have sleep and feel rested. In Jesus' name, I thank you for it. Amen. Let's praise God right now. Thank God for His goodness. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Some of you, when you leave here, when you go home today or when you go home after conference, there is further action that is required. If you have anything that has to do with witchcraft, you must get rid of it immediately. Do not have it on your person, in your house. Others of you, God's speaking to you. Go pray in your house. You rule in your house. The devil doesn't rule. Pray in your area. You pray in your church. And when I was struggling in fruitfulness in, in various places in the air where we'd go witness, I would go pray by myself and I would speak the blood of Jesus. I would tell the devil, you used to rule here, but not anymore because I'm a child of God. I'm taking that authority. You do that. You do what God tells you to do. Some of you, while I was preaching, lights were going on. You have objects people have given you. You have things at home and you say, you know, I never made the connection those people are from hell, so probably what they gave you is from hell. You do that. I'm believing God's going to set you free. God loves us, doesn't he? Yes. Thank God. Our brother's going to come. Let's give Jesus a clap off here. Thank God. Maybe as you were listening to this message today, something has stirred in your heart and you want to give your life to God. The Bible is very clear that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus died for us and that he rose again on the third day, we will be saved. That if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. The Bible also tells us that God is faithful and just, that if we confess our sins, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We've all messed up, done things that we're not proud of, and we instinctively know that there is a God in heaven who's going to judge us one day. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus died for you to wipe your slate clean. He was a substitute for you. He took your place. If you put your hope and your faith in this Jesus, if you would speak to him right now and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, turn and run to him. 
He will save you. He will help you. We have so many people that have come to Jesus and had their lives radically turned around by the power of his presence and grace. And if that's you, you want to receive Jesus in your life as your personal Lord and Savior, make that prayer today in the description and contact us. We want to pray with you. We want to help you on this journey and give you all the resources that you need to make it. God bless you and thank you again. We pray that you have found this content helpful and we want to encourage you to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you can be alerted every time we upload something and we pray that our content, especially in these last days, will be a blessing to you and draw you closer to Christ. If you want to find out more about the Sydenham Church, feel free to contact us. The details are in the description or visit our website at www.sydenhamcc.com.